which way? What up, bros? What up, bros? And welcome to Bra Meets World. What is Bra Meets World? Your boy meets world fan cast. I'm Siege. And I'm still Tony Curtis. And I am still here. We are still going. We are still doing our series recap. Uh, you guys, we did seasons one through seven. We talked about the characters. In this episode, we are going to be talking our best ofs. That's this some is superlatives, y'all. Yeah. I mean, as you guys know, we try to end every season with a report card where we talk about our best favorite characters or worst characters like best episodes all of that stuff so we were like we need to do a version of this for the entire damn series now that we've gone through every single season i feel like we're in the mindset to where we can do this in an accurate way um with all the considerations and i'm so excited to see if our answers match for the superlatives i don't think they will i'm gonna be honest <laughs> like i've actually like with some time and distance i've looked at this series so differently also um we've we've talked and promoted our prime meets world episodes on our patreon that's from meets world that mm -hmm. sorry patreon.com slash from meets world and um listening to pod meets world talk about the series like a lot of my thoughts are just kind of like yeah you know you know what <laughs> so uh yeah i don't know i'm excited to to get into this and talk best of because i have some hot takes so oh a controversial day all right well um you know siege like you said uh our listeners can check us out on our patreon please reach out also continue to write to us continue to comment and interact on our social posts even if you guys are follow, follow even if you guys are finding us later on down the road if you guys are listening to this in 2025 this that's the future I don't even know that we're doing this anymore, but please go back and explore our library, leave comments, and we will try to respond to those best we can, either on our Patreon or in some other way. Um, we just love the interaction with you guys. Absolutely. Uh, so are you ready to hop into this? I think so. We're getting into the superlatives. I think the best thing we can do is start with our best and our worst categories of the superlatives so siege i'm gonna go ahead and start this by asking you in the entire series of boy meets world who is the best character so uh you guys know me if you've been listening you know me by now you know that i don't take any of these questions like directly i kind of like think of them and interpret them in my mm -hmm. own way and anyway all i was gonna say is uh i thought about this as the show and the series has like a lot of ups and downs. There are lots of key moments. Uh, but objectively to me, I feel like Sean has the most arc. Like to me, yep. I feel like it actually at some point in time becomes Sean's show, even though he's not brought to the forefront. Um, and while I don't always agree with his actions or I don't always think that writer is like giving it his all, I do think that the Sean character character is the one that we as an audience leave kind of knowing the most about yep. and um who we've seen have like this traditional hero's journey i i think you're right you know um i think first of all i'll just say this sean was going to be my answer so i just have a lot to say about sean i truly agree that you're right out of all the characters probably besides the matthews maybe maybe even more than the matthews we learn more about sean and his family um so many of the emotional arcs the sweep sweep episodes have to do with sean is turner gonna adopt sean is you know sean's dad that you know all of those things played such a huge role in like the momentum of the show and pushing the story forward. So I think there's a, a big argument that can be made about Sean. The reason why I don't have Sean as my answer is because while I think, and I agree that he's the one who we learn the most about, I don't know that he's the best character simply because we get so much uh, potential for Sean to have a satisfying arc. And I have to be honest, I don't know that it's a satisfying arc for me. Like, well, I uh, just really quickly, I want to go like that goes back to the conversation of like, what is best. And I kind of like, mm. think that, that that's kind of like the thing you always get into whenever you have like a best of it's like, do you mean best as in this character is the one that teaches the lesson that the theory of the show was trying to convey the, the best? Do you mean someone who actually as a character 
gives you a beginning, middle, and end arc? Or do you mean the one that I like the most? Like, best can have so many different meanings. And for me, I chose to look at it as, like, this character yeah. is the best in terms that the show has to offer in showing us where he began, what what trials and tribulations he went through, and where he ends up. Like, that yep. is how I interpreted the best. So I want to hear your definition of best. So sure. I think that will that will help with your answer. I, I also think that the word best is very subjective, which is why I love having these conversations with you because I know we both have uh, true reasons for why we believe the things we believe and they're all rooted within the show, like the, the dynamic of the show. I think that it's very true that Sean more than Corey is who I'm rooting for. I would even go as far as to say that Sean, Eric, and Topanga are characters I care more about, I root for more than I ever did for Corey. So Corey is not even in the running. Um, honestly, Topanga is a character that going into the show, I would have thought she would have been my favorite character, but she was so absent. Underused. And underutilized. Um, they never thought to give us any background on her the way we did with Sean. Like you would think that Sean and Topanga would be on equal playing fields, at least after season four, we would get to know Topanga on a personal level. What's her home life like? I mean, she just moved in with her aunt. Like, how's that going? Like, there are so many things we could have done to explore her separate from Corey. But in the end, as I'm looking at the series, reflecting back, she was literally just there as a tool for Corey. And I don't, I mean, with the exception of a few key moments, specifically in the earlier half of the series, um, it, she's just not the character that was promised. So she doesn't make it to me. The character, surprisingly, that I have as my answer, George Feeney. Really? You know, honestly, I I would be willing to concede that. But again, that to me feels like the best as in who is the icon of this series. And, and best in terms of the character that like after I'm done, I've already ate this meal. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. What's the aftertaste that is tingling the most endorphins in, in my mouth right now? And to be honest, it's the idea of Feeney from the pilot episode telling Corey the most important thing you can do is find love. In season three, we learned that Feeney lost his love. And even though in the first few seasons, he seems to be taking school so seriously, you could almost tell that school has become a substitute for the relationship that he lost. So for him to, you know, after retirement, he's already given up. I don't even know if I would have worked anymore. I'm done. Like at season six, you could have, he could have ended his story, but he's like, you know what? I'm not done yet. Same thing with the Airbnb, the b, &B episode where he goes to knock on the couple's uh, honeymoon suite. Yeah. And he's like, Hey, yeah. I was young once too. And they come out and they're both older than Feeney. Just showing that Feeney has so much more life in him. He goes back to school, he falls in love, and then he ends up getting married again. Only to just, as we can tell, as far, as far as we can tell, continue having a life in academics until he just like, until the wheels fall off. So for me, just understanding the full scope of Feeney, even though he was never a main character, he's the character that I'm like, out of all the characters, the beginning, middle, and end of this character is the one I like the most. So that's what I'm picking. It's so funny to me because like I like while you were talking, I was thinking about like the analogy of you said like after this meal, what do I remember or what do I want more of? And I saw it as like for me, we went to a restaurant, we had like this seven course meal, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Feeny is the wine in that where Ooh. like sometimes the wine was good, sometimes the wine was bad. And you're like, this is kind of weak sauce. Like, why like like I've had better wine, but at the end of the meal, you're drunk and you're like, I don't even care. It was, it just went with the meal and it was good. And I really enjoyed the wine. Well, Whereas, I, I think that's such a great compliment because there's so many times where wine brings out the flavor of food. And I feel like Feeney has been that for so many of the characters that I think that's such a perfect analogy for what he contributes to the show. Exactly. And the reason why I said that is because like, when you said like, if I were to say, Hey, what was your favorite part of the meal? I'm going to be talking about the food. I'm going to be talking to, you know, mm. like, so for me, I was like, Sean is like, like pre 
probably my favorite course. But yeah. Feeney, you're right. He's been consistent. He's been there. He added something. He definitely is. I feel like, like Corey is like the turkey for the main course. It's like, <laughs> it's all right, but the sides were better. Exactly. Absolutely that, where you're like, I mean, it was kind of dry. And... But Sean's the mac and cheese, and Sean's Eric's the, the and stuffing. Cheese. And Sean's you know the what I mean? Mac and cheese. Yeah. Like, so you tell everybody about that mac and cheese. <laughs> 100%. The mac and cheese is the thing you come back for. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I think Feeney and Sean are great answers for this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, do you want to get into the next one? Yes. What is the worst character of the series? Oh, uh, okay. Going off of my same logic, I, I, I'm so looking forward to you hear your answer. But, like, when I thought worst, I just honestly thought of, like, most underutilized, most, like, what are we doing with this person? And like what did i want to see more of and i honestly was like mm, you could take it out and it wouldn't have really done that much uh and i'm gonna say morgan um and i say that not because i don't like the character of morgan or like the actresses that played her i say that because i don't think we've ever actually done anything with morgan that felt necessary we never did anything with morgan that felt impactful especially <laughs> after season one Yep. And I I think there were plenty of opportunities to, and I think that it could have been fun, but like Morgan was like the parsley in the meal yeah. where you're like, this wasn't necessary. I kind of feel like the chef was just giving me too much. I understand why you're there. I understand that a lot of people expect it, but at the end of the day, I just put it to the side. So that I'm that's just... that's me. I'm so glad that you brought up Morgan. You know, I didn't even consider her for obvious reasons because the show doesn't consider her. Um, but Morgan is so much a relic of the initial conception of the Ben Savage project. And what I mean by that is that the show was sold as, hey, this isn't the older cool kid. This is the middle child that's forgotten about. And Corey, like you talk about birth order all the time. Corey being a middle child was an essential part of his identity, how he was treated in the household for the first season. Like season one, it totally makes sense to have Morgan there so that Corey can be the middle child and wonder where he belongs within his family. The problem is that from seasons two onward, it's never about how Corey fits into his family. It's how he fits into school and how he fits into, you know, the life outside of his home. So Morgan doesn't have a place and she's so underutilized. Honestly, I'm just like, oh, they could have just gotten rid of Morgan, but she does play a key part in that first season. So I don't know, I definitely underutilized, if nothing else. I 100% agree. And I think it's kind of, um, you know, we talk about how the show always focuses on the boy and boy meets world um i think that the show misses so many opportunities by not exploring the female characters more the fact that we know eric and Corey so intimately but there's a third matthews child that we hardly know is crazy and yes it's a boy boy miss where yeah i get it but like there's three siblings and we're supposed to feel bad for Corey for being the forgotten one, but Corey's not the forgotten one. After seven seasons, he gets more attention than either Eric or Morgan. So why is the middle child thing? You know what I mean? It just didn't, it didn't grow to fruition the way I think they they had in mind. So I, I agree, Morgan's forgettable. I don't know if she's my worst character, but I appreciate your answer. Well, again, like I A, I would be very curious as to like what you defining as worst because mm -hmm. uh, i think that will really impact and maybe my answer will change but like just going off of like my interpretation of like what worst was i really just was like what character did the least to me and i feel like i can argue the value of just about every other character but i again i, I look forward to sure to i honestly had three answers i'm going to answer this question very quickly uh just because i don't want to spend a whole lot of time on each one um i had three answers uh the first one was Corey, um who i just felt like after the series, like the character is assassination of Corey from seasons five, six, and seven, like I am actively rooting against the main character of the show in a way that's like, I don't know how to separate it. Like all of the discourse online about Boy Meets World, like, uh, like we're not the only ones viewing this with 2024 eyes or whenever we started this podcast, like the 2020 vision of it all is something that the entire fan group is going through as they're re-watching this series along with pod meets world and we're not the only ones to realize that Corey is shit you can search tiktok there's tons of videos right now going into detail about all the times Corey was a piece of shit and i feel like for us to walk away from a show where the main character is someone that we care the least about i think is probably the 
the worst thing about Boy Meets World is that while I have a reason to root for Sean, I have a reason to root for Eric, I have a reason to root for Topanga. I'm never given a reason to root for Corey. I disagree. And I was gonna do something, and this is why I didn't choose Corey. I felt like Corey was like the obvious answer. It's like, oh yeah, of course, yeah. like like saying Corey to me was very much um like right there. And it and a lot of it has to deal with how he is in the later season. Mm -hmm. However, when I looked at it holistically, we're talking about the entire series. I cannot say that Corey was a terrible character throughout all. Like when Corey yeah. is playing uh, middleman between uh, Sean's parents, like yeah, that's yeah. when he's actually really good. When he's playing mediator between Topanga's parents, that's when he's at his worst. When yeah. he is learning lessons about consent and challenging himself with Danger Boy and like all of these other things, Corey's actually pretty phenomenal. Um, and we actually like Corey when Corey, I think I think the problem with Corey is that Corey works best as a uh uh not a side character, a supporting a character. Kick, a supporting yeah, character. I think definitely. that's when it really shines because when you take all when you take the eye off of what he wants and what he's willing to do to get what he wants, mm -hmm. he is just there, like you said, if they were to lean into uh, Corey Matthews being more like Arnold from Hey Arnold, I think we would love that character yeah. because when he is allowed to be supportive, he's fantastic. And when a character like that is is kind of selfish and self-centered, we understand that that is just one part of his personality. It's not sure. all of it. And instead, later on in later seasons, we get really, really selfish Corey. And I think and there's, that- there's an there's an imbalance. There's an yeah. imbalance between his own consideration and his consideration for others. Whereas that balance is there throughout the first few seasons. Yeah. And my, my, to, to that point, all I was going to say is like, to me, if this, if we were grading, Corey would get like a C because it's like, you didn't quite fail. You're not the worst. You don't like fail and mm -hmm. look out, but you did, you were not the shining star that I thought you were going to get. So that's the reason why I said Corey initially, but the more I thought about it, I really struggled between Jack and Rachel. I think mm. both of them are deserve the nomination for worst character of the series. No, nothing against Matt Lawrence, who I love. I've been listening to so much brotherly love podcasts. I <laughs> love the Lawrence brothers. Matt, please yep. don't take this personally. This has nothing against <laughs> you. I just feel like there's so much you could have done with the character of Jack Hunter coming in as Sean's brother, presenting him with a new permanent family member fixture where he never had that before. There's just so much they could have done. And even as I'm listening to Pod Meets World, they're like, yeah, they gave up on that after like two episodes. And I'm like, they really did. And so it's like, what the hell is Jack otherwise, other than to be a, a, a straight man for Eric. And I just, I just don't know that they ever nailed his character. And I feel the same way about Rachel. Like, I just don't know that they ever nailed her character. I don't know. They had so many opportunities to make her uh, a friend to Topanga and Angela, which they never went through with. They had so many opportunities for her to deepen Jack and Eric's understanding of women, which they played around with in season six, but they never went all the way with um there's that great episode where um you know you're married you're dead where they go to like the the hooters themed thing and rachel's writing a paper on how male behavior changes based off of you know the presence of women and so she's doing this like feminist paper about these boys in a titty bar essentially like trying to have a moment of um i don't know bring a a, a some levity brings some insights from a woman's perspective into what's happening. And I, they could, I really wish they would have pushed the pedal on that and really floored it hard. And they just did it. So I, honestly, between Corey, Jack and Rachel, I, I agree that Corey, not so much as the other two, but I think that Jack and Rachel were so underutilized. I almost think you could probably get rid of either one and still have a seasons five, six and seven. Well, I think, well, I, I'll, I will say this. One, to kind of defend Jack's character. I think that, especially on upon this rewatch, I think that they don't use Jack as well as they could, but Jack works as a really good secondary character to uh, Eric. And I don't know if we could have Eric as long as we did if Eric is only the older, older brother. I think giving Jack a partner and, you know, um, we we're going to talk about it a little bit later in one of our latest, but like uh, removing Jason from um, 
Eric's character and instead giving him a different sidekick, someone to play off of, and it being someone like Jack, I do think that that chemistry worked. And that's like the one reason why I was like, Jack is also someone where I'm with you, where it's like the potential is there, but unfortunately we don't get that and we don't see it to fruition. So I do think that you're right that he's like a lower character. However, I do think that they what Matthew Lawrence is able to do with a very with very little is important. Also, he extends the show out. Now, you could blame him for that, but he's uh, key in extending the show into the college years. That's true. The, yeah. the one difference I will say is, uh, Rachel, I agree with you where it's like, I don't know. I feel like we do need Rachel. Like, we need more feminine energy, but we don't actually get it with the character of Rachel. No. I don't know if we need Rachel as a character. Mm -hmm. and, like and and I still feel like to me to me Morgan is like less like like I said sure. Morgan's my worst my worst character um just because like we do way less with that character than we do even with Rachel but Rachel is a character where at, we have like we don't even have like episodes we have moments mm -hmm. that I really really enjoy and I really do feel um show the potential of that character and I feel like she does add balance with the girls and the guys. So, like, I, I I don't think we need Rachel. I think Rachel would have been, like, my number two character to, like, choose. Um, but I think what we're really talking about here is when we say worst characters, there are – this also could be, like, wasted potential. You yeah. know what I mean? And honestly, that's that's what I mean. Like, to me, a character – a worst character is, like – I'm invested. I'm invested in the character of Sean. So when you say that he's meeting his mother and his mother and dad are reuniting and their families reuniting, like I'm invested into that story because you spent half of season four telling it. And then we never saw his mom again, only to be told later his that wasn't his mom. <laughs> and so like, that's what I mean in terms of like disappointments. Rachel and Jack, I'm invested in Eric. And the only reason why Rachel and Jack are even important at all is because of my investment in Eric. I don't ever grow to invest in Jack and Eric as in, I mean, Jack and Rachel as individuals. See, and I like, I, I think that's so funny because like I look at Jack and I am interested in Jack. Like, I mm. think we just don't do anything with it. I've yeah. said this repeatedly and I'm like, whatever, if you don't agree, but like, I feel like Jack and even it, it comes so late into the season, but when we see Jack just kind of look at Corey during the reunion episode and be like, mm, I don't like you. Like, it's like, yeah. we don't really have anything to talk about. I was like, that is something that you could have leaned into. I, the fact of him, like when we later on in the season have him be like a spoiled rich kid, I'm like, this yeah. is so much fun. Let's do this. Um, Him as Sean's brother is actually fun and full of potential. We just never use it. I actually do care about Jack. I want to, we made up an entire cast of like what we thought his stepfather and his mom would be because we wanted to learn more about this character. Because the we thing, needed to do something to deepen his character more than what was given so we were constantly if you go back and listen to our season five six and seven like episodes we're constantly coming up with ideas for like what could we get more of from jack that would help us make sense of all this i would say two things either jack is just eric's roommate not sean's brother and you can continue seasons five six and seven with very little changes um or he is Sean's brother, and like we said, he is arrogant and rich and the polar opposite of Sean from the get. And we don't get either of those things, and it's very unsatisfying. And his story arc could be, and look, look we're doing it right now. Mm -hmm. But like the fact that we're doing it right now, to me, shows that it's not that I don't care about Jack. It's that I'm not given anything yeah. to care about Jack. I do care about Jack. And I was going to say, like to me, his story arc could have been, I'm spoiled rich kid who learns the value of friends and family. I've yeah. never had a brother. Mm -hmm. um, I just was listening to uh, Pommy's World, and they reminded me that in like one of the early se seasons, Jack said, my sister went to China. So Jack has other siblings. Like, talk about that. Like, yeah. There are other things that we could have expressed. Is his sister Sean the sister that Sean was talking about? Ooh, um, that's Stacy that straightened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh my God. Exactly. Like, that's what. Uh, and thank you for saying Stacy. The only reason why I didn't say it, audience, is because my mind kept saying Nebula and I was like, that's Topanga. So, so that's like, Topanga. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Stacy is the one from Alternative Friends that Sean calls on the phone to be like, hey, I need. To, I need help with my friend's hair. 
Um, Why yeah. couldn't Stacy be the same sister that Jack is talking about? Yeah. And then, like, again, we could have just explored so much more. I think that they, by making Jack uh, Sean's brother, they established a connection and a history and a backstory that we're already kind of aware of. We're like, all right, we know that one of your parents is uh, a Chet. We know yep. that one of your pa- one of your siblings is Sean. We know that Sean is messed up because of the trauma of his parents and they their um, financial status and their instability. Yeah. You grew up completely differently. So what is it like to grow up outside of that instability but at the exact same time, share a shared history. That 100%. is very, very interesting. Also, we've talked about it with the Eric of it all. The will they, won't they of of Jarek is in fact something that I found joy in. A lot of fun. Like it gave me a lot of fun just like as a fan theory, but also it's right there. The chemistry, like um, I, I believe I was listening to Pot Meets World the other day and Will said like, if this was made today, there's a good chance Eric would be gay. And it's like, and it makes sense. It's right there. There was just a lot that they set up with Jack that they never delivered on. And I personally don't want to blame either Matthew Lawrence or even that character for it, because I feel like they had so much potential. Their stories just never go anywhere. Whereas with Rachel, Rachel doesn't re doesn't bring much more to the story other than to be a foil to the inevitable Jarek. Like she's kind of brought in to be like, they're not gay. And I feel like that's unfortunate for her. And then when we are given opportunities for them to be, um, to have the three female leads be together and actually have storylines that depend on them being three college females, that's even taken away. And I just feel like it just goes nowhere. I, I'm so glad that you brought up Jarek because it's so fun to listen to season five of Pod Meets World and hearing Will Friedle being like, no, I see it. I get it yeah. and I see yeah. it. You know what I mean? It's something like, again, another waste of potential of, of Jack where he could have gone a third route of being this new partner for Eric in a world where Eric has given up on women. Um, okay. I think we need to move on to the next one. <laughs> we spent a lot of time on this. What are your favorite side characters, cameos, guest stars? Who, When you look back on the seven seasons of Boy Meets World and you're thinking about all the side fun characters that we had, well, who's coming to your mind as the best? I think you just did something that was really important, and I just want to acknowledge it because it, it helps with our conversation, which is you said favorite. The notes asked best, but best. I think that – but here's the thing. Saying favorite actually changes the categories, and when we when we have these conversations, it goes from best as in objectively who or my interpretation of what best is to just favorite, and it becomes like, the, hey – I think is- it's a mix of the two, honestly. The answer should be a mix of the two. <laughs> uh anyway um so i made like you i gave like a list of both uh side characters cameos and guest stars that i just thought were like really fun and stood out to me um i feel like my list is probably not gonna be as in-depth as yours but i'm I'm looking forward to it uh i wrote jason uh jason marsden Mm -hmm. i think he was a really fun side character especially in the early seasons i don't know if that character would have aged well if it had more screen time but i I thought like when it was there it was really fun turner um Mm -hmm. i'm not sure if we're considering turner a side character but turner i i think other than the kids and the family and feeny you can do side characters for the rest i think that's fair so turner was a really Mm -hmm. great character he brought so much uh in terms of like cool teacher also he brought so much to our podcast with our turn down by turner Ooh. which can exactly. i just quickly i know i've said this on our podcast before but guys we met Anthony <laughs> quinn at the pod meets world live show one time and we went to him to talk to him like i remember us being in this room with all the boy meets world stars i know i've said this before i don't care we were in the room with all the boy meets world stars and we were like it was just us and them and we didn't we were like okay i guess we're gonna start conversations so we started talking to tony and we were like we have this whole segment about turned on by turner and he looked so like 
like uncomfortable. Okay, what do I do like, with this information? Okay, like, I don't know. It was a big deal to us, but it was one of those moments where I was like, oh, I think I made him uncomfortable. Well, here's like for me, and I've said this even when we talked about it the first time. Uh, for me, it was like, uh, this may make you uncomfortable, and I'm uncomfortable bringing it up, but I'd rather have this conversation than not bring it up. Sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and some, somewhere down the line, he might see someone wearing a turned on by Turner shirt, and at least he'll know. It was exactly, us. <laughs> exactly. Um, so Turner, uh, Minkus is another one of where course. it's like his his presence was so important that you actually think he's part of the show longer than he is. And when they do bring him back in the, uh, I think it's important that they bring him back even for the graduation episode, yeah, season five, because that goes to show his impact. Um, Julius Carey, uh, I thought Julius mm. was another great guest star because not only Sergeant was it- Moore. Sergeant Moore, not only does he do a great job as Angela's dad, but there was so much chemistry between him and Will when there's really no storylines with him and Will. So that just goes to show how great he was able to do, especially uh, it felt lived in. It felt like he had a history with Angela. It felt like he was actually impressed by Sean and all of these things from someone who only made two appearances as their notable character and one more appearance as like the college teacher. So yeah. Show enough. Julius Carey, show enough. Um, and then last, but la- my last one is Brittany Murphy. Uh, that's, yeah. I think part of that is just the fact that Brittany Murphy is so iconic and so lovable and such a uh, symbol of like a nineties youth. Uh, yep. But I have to say I, Trini was fun and I wish we had got more Trini as well. A hundred percent. Um, you know, a lot of your list mimics my list. List. I have some other ones, but I just a lot of my list. Ta- list <laughs> mimics your list. <laughs> my list mimics your list in a few ways. Yes, I said list, list, list. <laughs> uh, the one thing I want to start with is Trini because not only do I think she was so um interesting, like obviously Brittany Murphy has a reputation of her own, but the idea of being, we're gonna give Topanga a friend. And we're going to make that friend weirder than Topanga. I remember us talking about this and being like, oh, this actually could be such a great balance between the Topanga of season one and the new Topanga to be like, yeah, she still has that weird side that never left her. It's just not a side that Corey ever like dives into the way that she has other friends that could do that for her. So I feel like we lost something with Penguin when we got rid of Trina. So that's why I feel like she belongs on this list just because of the way she was able to give some insight into the character of Topanga. Minkus, of course, is on my list. We voted him the VIP of season one. I still think that Minkus spinoff could have worked. I think that Lee Norris, even like I went on to watch One Tree Hill. I don't know if you watched One Tree Hill or not. I could do a whole mouth. podcast on fucking One Tree Hill, bro. <laughs> that show is batshit crazy. Anyways, but even as mouth on One Tree Hill, Lee Norris is still so endearing. He's so captivating. Like, he was just like, he stole my heart on that show in a different way than he did with Minkus, which just really showed me the range of Lee Norris. So I just think that he was so great as Minkus and iconic. Obviously, Jason and Turner are standouts. The few that you didn't say that I just want to give reference to... I want to give a quick shout out to Griff. See, Adam, I, here's the thing. I'm not going to lie. I was like, I could do it out Griff. I didn't say it because I didn't want the hate, but in reality, I'm going to say it. Fuck Griff. <laughs> okay. And you know what? That's fair. You feel the way you feel about Griff. I'm going to say I was, in all respect to, to Danny, I was never a huge fan of the character of Harley Kiner. To me, he felt like something that was retro in a way that didn't make sense. In the, especially when we go into season two, everything feels like it's from the 1950s and it just doesn't fucking make sense to me. I'm sure that in the same way that we're having like a 70s renaissance in the 2020s, like there was a 50s renaissance in the 1990s that made sense for it. But in rewatch, it just doesn't play. The character of Griff, we only got like two or three episodes from, and I felt like he was so charming within those few episodes that we got that I was just like, oh, for me to remember you, not just because you're Adam Scott, but because the character of Griff was like so smooth and charming, of course, he added a lot of storylines that made no sense. The character of Griff is probably the most nonsensical of all the characters that we've been introduced to, but... I was kind of there for it. So I don't know. He gets a shout See, out from me. I just want to say that really quick while we're talking about Griff, like that's not how my I remember Griff. I remember Griff as kind of like a like 
maybe an updated version of Fonzie where it was like almost too cool for school. And I know all- I remember this. You said over and over again, what are we doing? Yeah. Why this? Why are we having a wrestling tournament in the middle of school? Like all the exactly. things that Griff, because Griff was basically Ferris Bueller. Like Griff yeah. was like this person who came in yeah. and like larger than life, unexplainable things happened, but because he was so cool, you were supposed to go along with it. And I do Correct. think a Ferris Bueller type character like that can belong, but because he was so extreme, it was hard for you specifically to just be like, I, I can't go on board with I this. I love that you remember that because like in reality, that's how I feel about that character. I feel like that character um doesn't really add anything i like that they took it away because like i think that um i didn't mention them and maybe these are on your list but i feel like frankie and joey actually do better at like being grounded in this world and Mm -hmm. still making sense still having some kind of like larger than life personas and abilities but still being something where i'm like you still fit in this world even though you're clearly older than our main cast whereas griff just feels like he's like some fanfic novel of what a cool dude is yeah i don't feel connected to you in any way because there's nothing about you that feels real sure other sure, than sure. you're no longer in the 50s and at least i'll give you that <laughs> yeah exactly um i'm so glad you brought up uh joey and frankie while joey isn't on my list because i just don't think the show dives into his character as much as frankie frankie is a hundred percent on my list frankie i think is such an interesting character this idea of taking a guy who physically is very intimidating but then making him the sweetest most poetic like juxtaposition of his visual appearance i think is so smart um we have some great episodes with frankie like the cyrano episode where he's trying to win over harley's girlfriend and Corey and sean are whispering in his ear we have new friends and old that's the one where they're like taking advantage of the fact that he's harley uh uh, frankie the enforcer and he's like no i just want to be like treated as a person and he challenges sean and Corey to like think of him other than that and not abuse his friendship with him and then obviously i think frankie plays a huge part in like the Chet and Verna storyline as well as like being like another person in the trailer park. This is someone who comes from the same uh, place as Sean. So in those early seasons where Sean is like debating if he wants to be a bad boy or not, it kind of makes sense because Frankie literally is the trailer two trailers down. So like they come from the same cloth. Um, So I, I just think that Frankie's great. My number one cameo, Chet Hunter. Chet uh, I can't is believe. my number one. I can't believe I forgot Chet. I Chet love is Chet. magic. I could have used 19,000 more episodes with Chet. Um, I wish he was someone that they brought on to be a regular. Honestly, I don't think he ever made it. I think season four was probably the closest we had of him just doing consistent episodes. But he just never was brought on for a season the way that like Eli was. And I wish he was because, I mean, the not only what he does for Sean's character. But I just don't know if we've had a more charming son of a bitch on the show than Blake Clark. So to me, he's my number one. Absolutely. I like, I think it's amazing. First of all, Blake Clark, amazing actor, so good in this show, so impactful. Mm-hmm. Literally the writers felt the same because they just keep bringing him back. And to hear that this is kind of like his first um, run into doing drama yeah with this this uh role is amazing because it's like oh you do it so well and he nailed I, it i think the thing about chet that is an amazing that makes him an amazing character is you believe every thing that comes out of his mouth now yeah. that does not mean that you think he's telling the truth but you believe that he believes it or you believe that he's trying to get you to believe it yeah. and that means he could say the most outlandish things and you're like you would tell me that like they're <laughs> like i like i think it's one of those very rare characters where it kind of gets to um oh you know what it is it's kind of like um what is the thing i think ken in um 30 rock Oh yeah, yeah. It becomes this thing of like they could say just about anything, but like it's also becomes like magical in the world of like, oh, are you of this planet? And that's sure. kind of like the thing that I think is weird is like most characters where you have that are like side characters and you just continuously learn about them, they become otherworldly and they stand out of space and time. But yeah. the thing that's great about Chet Hunter is he stays 
in the place and time that you need him to be. And you're still like, yep, you would still tell me these things. You could tell me that you spent last week with three Colombians in the back seat yeah. of a U-Haul. And I'd be like, maybe you did. I don't know your life. A hundred percent. And to meet random people who are like, yeah, Sean's my brother. I believe it. Yeah. Ch Hunter, <laughs> I believe it. That he's good with ladies. Like, that makes sense to me. It's so funny because, like, uh, you can tell we have, we are, like, in the middle of, like, listening to Pop Meets World season five. But in, they just talk about the fact that um, Jack starts speaking Chinese in the middle of, like, one of the episodes. And they go, I love that all of Chet's kids can just, and it's like, what? Well, that's not something that they said. That's something that we implanted because Chet is so iconic and so diverse and so such a swindler of a character yeah. that the mere fact that his kids have all of these things that don't make sense, the moment you put Chet's child at the top of that list, Everything makes Everything sense. Everything makes sense. <laughs> I just want to quickly, uh, I'm just going to list a few things that Blake, because I was like, why wasn't Blake Clark a bigger star? Let me just show you this. The amount of television shows that this dude has been on. Greatest American Hero, MASH, Moonlighting, The Bob Newhart Show, Facts of Life. He was on Roseanne, Grace Under Father, uh, Fire, Home Improvement, The Drew Carey Show, Boy Meets World, Coach, Murphy Brown, Smart Guy, The J Jamie Foxx Show, like Sabrina the Teenage Witch, My Name is Earl, Everybody Hates Chris. This dude was like a television special appearance cameo person that I saw so much over the years. But even after all of that, I'm like, I need a Blake Clark show. And I'm so yes. upset we never got it. Yes, I agree with you. I think like it's just one of those things to where um, we didn't really understand the value of this character and this actor, and they didn't really know how to put a vehicle behind him. And what's interesting is I think if we, we've always talked about like expanding the Michael Jacobs universe and like mm -hmm. doing these spinoffs. Um, I think we've, we talked about Chet being mm -hmm. the one that you would build a spinoff around. Yeah. Chet bounty hunter slash truck driver. <laughs> like, like, but it's, 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 it's fun and it's nonsense, but like if any character could have a show built around them and their, their journey as this kind of a cross country, um, always gets into hijinks, always learning lessons, always being able to kind of have like a, a pearl of wisdom and insight mm -hmm. um, while also somehow being a terrible person. Like no one would want to be related to Chet, but everyone loves when Chet walks into a room. And I think that's, I think that's impressive. I think, I think we I have think... few anti-heroes on Boy Meets World and he's one of the few that we have. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, I think the answer is Chet. Like, when the I, like, Chet. based on the enthusiasm, Chet may be the best side character that we've gotten because of, again, how both wild and chaotic and unreal it is while still being a grounded character that makes us feel things even when he dies. 100%. Um, just to move on with our superlatives, I feel like this one won't be as long of an answer, but I'm curious to know what are the best and worst seasons of Boy Meets World? Uh, okay. You know, I thought of this objectively. I'm going to say that the problem with this question is different seasons of Boy Meets World are different. Um, so I Different would strokes that... for different folks. Like, well, yeah. No, I'm just saying like season one to me is the best season of its theory of like, middle child uh my father versus my teacher i'm learning about life i think that season yeah. one does that the best uh if you're gonna ask me my favorite throughout i'm gonna say season four i feel like season four was the sweet spot um so that's my answer for best what's yours uh season four is also my answer for best i don't need to go into this you guys know how i feel about season four uh and then worst uh i'm putting this not because i hate it but because we have gone so far from where we were at season one and where and even the balance that we had at season four and i'm gonna say season seven it's so funny my worst season season six really? i think that if you watch seasons one through five because if you remember Corey and topanga get engaged at the end of season five you could just jump into season seven and it you could just jump into 67 you know season six is so dark it's so solemn there's very few highlights like when i was going through all the episodes i was like i think i would honestly rather watch rewatch more episodes of season seven than season six just because of how dark it is 
You know, I think that we forget how bad the writing is in season seven. However, I agree with you where it's like tonally. I looked at all the episodes in season six. So like season six is dark it is relentless it's just like beating you over the head with like this really heavy kind of soap opera of uh of, of a turn yeah uh and i absolutely look forward to seeing uh pod cover it because i'm again i was like will they even make it to season seven i feel like at some point in time especially mm-hmm. the way that they're talking about season five they may just quit they may quit. like we're out <laughs> um do you have a best episode or a few best episodes what you consider best episodes of the series uh of the series again i chose this as if i'm going to say best i think what encapsulates the series as a whole if i were to say this is boy meets world this is what i want you to learn about boy meets world Mm -hmm. i think that uh Corey's alternative friends and boy meets girl are it like i don't know if it ever becomes a synopsis of itself better than those two episodes. I I made a top five because I had a really hard time choosing, but Corey's Alternative Friends was my number one. So just for just take it from our mouths, guys. The Brown Meets World guys consider Corey's Alternative Friends to be the best episode of the series. Some runner-ups I had were the pilot episode. I think it's great. And then there was Sean, obviously. Just I, I love rewatching that episode. That's probably the most rewatchable yeah, episode of the I, series. Yeah, I feel like that's the most rewatchable, and I feel like that's the most fun, and I feel like that's a fan favorite. But I don't like if I were to show that. Yeah, to I don't me, think it's a fair representation. Lives, it lives outside of space and time. It's not really what the show is about. So I don't think it's a good representation. It's not canonized. And it's one of the few non-canon episodes that I enjoy. Um, The other two that I had on there, just like at the bottom of my top five, were Wake Up Little Corey and Hair Today, Goon Tomorrow. Both of those are Topanga-centered episodes. Uh, I think Wake Up Little Corey is so underrated in terms of, like, media literacy, in terms of dealing with sex, in terms of dealing with, like, reputation and gender dynamics. There's just so many interesting things happening in that episode um, that I just, I, I think it definitely deserves a spot within the top five top ten so it was absolutely uh for me it was my number two mm. I'm sorry, my number three uh so i i completely agree with you it's so funny uh, that your number two was Gr- uh girl meets boy like topanga episodes are the ones that come through for us but here's the thing topanga episodes when done right are what we remember about mm-hmm. this series like the thing is there's a reason why it's Corey and topanga yeah Corey topanga and sean in reality the, this show works best when it's working off of and it gives equal weight to two sides of an argument. Like that's when it really works as its best. And it always falls short when it only wants to tell one side. And I will just say that like, give Danielle Fischel a moment to shine and she'll take it. Like th- those moments where they give her something, she comes through. And I think that Danielle is the reason why we have this idea of Topanga more than the actual character of Topanga. So um, yeah, those episodes are great. What do you consider the worst episodes of the series? This is, I'm so excited to have this. I think you already know, because in reality, like uh, there are two that have been consistent to me. And I've, I literally, I thought about it over and over again. Um, I'm going to say that the true and the psychotic episode to me were like, I, I honestly feel like I would take you off the air. (laughs) Like I, I don't, need a moment if i saw more. be true i'm like okay so we're done this season right yeah. yeah we're done this is it like i don't need anything more and then the psychotic episode again it's very much like what are we doing mm. why are we doing this Wh- whose idea was this like i just yeah. feel like those two episodes in and of themselves and for them to come at such a later time made me be like i don't know if this show needs to still be on the air I I I agree. Those those are rough spots. They did not make my list for worst episodes. Ooh, so you, um, you know, like I said, I had to do a top five because I had a hard time like picking just one. But see if you can see any similarities between these episodes. As time goes by, <laughs> I was a teenage spy. No <laughs> guts, no Corey. Corey the Wolf and Eric Hollywood. Any similarities? <laughs> Any time travel, non-canonized <laughs> side quest bullshit going on in these episodes? Because these are the episodes that literally make no impact 
in the series. When you watch any of these time travel episodes, when you watch Eric Hollywood, that whole storyline of Eric going to Hollywood to be on the TV show because he's such a good gifted actor literally never comes back. None of the storylines in any of these episodes mean anything. And then there was Sean is the one episode that I'm like, oh, I think contextually this still makes sense. It works and within the whole Corey Topanga breakup series. But I mean, going back to the black and white 40s, going back to, uh, you know, World War II or going back to the 1950s or just all of this shit, Corey turning into a werewolf, it just never worked for me. I've said this to the cast. I've said this to our pod. A ton of times but these are the episodes i think you can control alt delete and the series continues on see and i disagree because i feel like those episodes but not all of them i don't i will not stand here and be like they're all good they're not um but i've already made my case for as time goes by i feel like that episode is actually not that bad i just you know what you can't make a case for no guts no cory that's what why are we in paris (laughs) what's going on (laughs) wait as i said i was i was going there i was getting there but i was saying that i've made my case for as time goes by and i feel like as time goes by has poor placement in the season i think you move that okay. episode and in the season and then you're just having a fun romp um i think that um the what is it the russian spy i was a teenage spy episode i don't think it's great i think i had a lot of problems with it but in reality we still get some fun with the cast i think to me the the real problem with uh episodes like be true or the psychotic episode or there's another one uh i'm thinking of um i think it's like for love of apartments i didn't put it as my worst but it's up there as some of the worst to me the problem with those are these are canon episodes i'm supposed to believe that whatever happened in this episode happened and i'm supposed to stick with the consequences of what happened in these episodes i i i do agree that there's a it's like um to watch the truman show episode and believe that this actually happened in real life and that we're all moving on afterwards as if nothing happened is actually crazy but i also think that Corey turning into a werewolf is just as crazy and doesn't serve a purpose. So, like, I I don't know. Like, I do think that there's an argument to be made that the worst episodes that are canonized maybe hurt the series more. But the fact that there's so many episodes that just are pointless at the end of the day. Or I I, I, I don't, like, for example, for the As Time Goes By... I'm like, whose fantasy am I even in? Whose world is this? Like, there's so many questions I have throughout these episodes where I'm like, I don't know that any of this means anything to anyone else in the cast other than the person who's going through this dream experience. And even then, I don't know that it's sticking and around. And here's the thing. I, I, I will not argue against you. I think my, and I will only de- uh, express my interpretation. And my interpretation of, like, worst would be something that I don't find any sense of joy out of i don't think the actors were having fun i don't think the episode made any sense uh or had any like real motivations i don't think the writing was good Mm -hmm. like that's where i actually am like oh this is like bottom of the barrel to me because i will say there are episodes that i don't think were good but i do think that oh it looked like they were having fun or oh you kind of made sense very loosely but like okay i'm willing to go with it and then there are certain episodes where i I look at and I'm like did we even take a time to look over the script or was it just like you know like like there are certain episodes that make me question when I start to question what was going on in the writer's room that's when I'm like this episode needs to be talked about <laughs> um yeah and you know what I think there are a ton like that I think there are just more of those that fall into the shades of gray Mm -hmm. than these ones that kind of appear very obvious to me. So that's, that's my list, but I'm glad we got to talk about it. Hey, let me ask you this question out of all the storylines, out of everything that we've gotten from the seven seasons, what was the most unexpected plot twist that happened throughout the seven seasons of Boy Meets World. It's so funny that you say that because if you want me to be honest, I think that like my answer was the backflips that this series will go through to make Corey right. That is oh. like the, that's the plot <laughs> twist to me. The the way that this series will bend over backwards to be like Corey did all of these things wrong. But Sean was with him, so let's talk about how Sean's behavior is poor. Yeah. <laughs> or Corey did all of these things wrong and disrespected Topanga. 
But Topanga is a woman and kind of feeling emotions too strongly. So let's talk about how Topanga is overthinking this. Like, that's the problem to me. Sure. When I look at it, like, we didn't mention, and I can't believe we didn't mention this, but, like, in the guest stars and all this other stuff, Lauren. Lauren mm. is a perfect example of a episode where you're like, oh, we have someone who just blatantly is cheating and lying and hiding it. And I was like, where are we going from here? And where did we go? We went to, but isn't Topanga kind of taking this a little too seriously? Like, I mean, it's time to- She kissed the guy, I kissed the girl, it's the same. <laughs> I don't see what the problem is. Yes, we were in a relationship when I kissed the girl and we weren't in the relationship when she kissed that guy, but it's the same. Yeah, so you know what we should do after this? Let's try to have sex. And then get married because that's where our relationship is now. So that's what I think about an unexpected plot twist. I, I want to know your answer to this because I know that that's not what you had in mind. Yeah. But when you wrote down that question, I was very much like, to me, the real twist of this series is to see the myriad of ways that Corey gets a opportunity to actually learn a lesson that I think should be taught now. And yeah. instead it goes, but we can't judge Corey. He's yeah, a boy and boy meets world. Who else can we blame? And that's that's my answer. Um, I have two answers for this. One is a positive, one is a negative. The positive one for me is Long Walk to Pittsburgh. In terms of plot twists, in terms of like watching this show live, when Topanga left and came back, like that was a true like <gasps> moment for me as a kid. It was also one of my first times as a kid. Like, for example, I. I did watch Friends live, but I didn't get into it until the later seasons because I was a little younger. You know what I mean? Like, I it was my first time being, like, wrapped up in the storyline and being like, oh, shit, what's going to happen? Was Topanga leaving? So wa Long Walk to Pittsburgh, in terms of, like, unexpected from, like, me watching the show first time through, that was, like, a mind fuck. That was it. But negative category was the revelation of Sean's mom not being that was the one that I was just like, no, 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 no. The Family Trees episode of season seven <laughs> goes into detail of Sean learning from Ghost Chet that his mom was like a stripper who never wanted him. And it goes into <laughs> such a weird direction to give us this exposition that we don't we don't even know as an audience that we can trust because he's learning it from a ghost. So it's like. Is this real? Is this all in Sean's head? It's all bullshit. Why does this matter? Why are we doing this? I don't want it. I don't want Here's it. Here's the thing. First of all, I don't disagree with you in the sense of why are we doing this? I don't want it. I completely end there. The thing that I will say is this goes back to the character that they bu built with Chet. Because of who we know Chet to be, finding out later that Verna is not Sean's mom, I agree, sucks. But also I was like, eh. I can see it. You know, like, like that, that that's the thing. Honestly, and I, it the, if it comes at like towards the middle end of season seven, where I'm just like, we're too late in the series. It's too late to throw this in. I would have preferred if Sean got a letter saying Verna died. Hey, yeah. your mom did abandon you, passed away, and now you have to like come to terms with what that meant in a way that would help him in Angela's relationship, help him heal with a bunch of things. It's just to, for him to find out like I went through all of that for nothing with a woman who's not my mom, really. Like, I just, it, it just, it, to me, it was a negative turn that the show, the series well, took. I mean, like, but. I don't know, like, if we're talking about negative turns, I just want to bring up the fact that, like, Amy getting pregnant again. I was like, that didn't go anywhere. It did. It wasn't for anything. We don't learn anything new about Amy. We don't get anything other than the fact that she may die. And even that episode is mostly about how Corey feels about it. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, like, I don't know if I needed Amy to get pregnant in season. I, I will five. say that, like, the Joshua health scare, there were some things that I had in the running here. Like, Joshua's health scare, um, well, Amy's health scare, I should really say. The yo-yoing of Corey and Topanga of are we going to get married, are we not, between six and seven, I was kind of over. Um, but I just think in terms of, like, unexpected plot twist when we got to that episode and i remember watching this live where they said sean's mom's not his mom i was like what the fuck are we doing so well, i will say i had it spoiled for me in like season two so Sorry. i here's the thing that would have been a shock for me had i had i been able to watch it and just react to it but i had known since season two because you told me so i think like just going i think that would have been a to be honest i think that would have been a bigger shock
Okay. Uh, yep. And I would have been surprised. But... Well, spoilers. <laughs> I love it. No, no apology. You're just that. Ah, well, it, it beats like that. The show that. ended in 2000. There's no apologies <laughs> for spoilers. Well, I will say uh, what I was also going to say is if we want to talk about pivots, I I heard them kind of talk about it, and I'm going to say the same thing. I don't think Eric is the same once he decides to go to college. In reality, we choose for him to go to college. And I don't see his life improve at all. I don't see anything from this character that seems like he's on a good path. And I honestly feel like one of the real twists, if you want to put it that way, is the show forcing this character to go to college and then not rewarding him for that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a a bigger structural issue with the later half of the series. Um but I, I do agree that, like, the character of Eric never recovers from college, which have any of us have any of us recovered? <laughs> have any of us paid the debt back? Like, what are we doing, guys? Um, they still hounding me right now. <laughs> Pay us back. I said, no. I said, no. <laughs> I was supposed to fix this shit. You better um, talk to Joe. <laughs> yeah, you better talk to Kamala. You better talk doing to Joe shit. before he leaves, because I don't even know if Kamala got it on her to-do <laughs> list. But I'm telling you right now, Joe say he got it. All right. <laughs> Send my bill to him. Siege, within the history of this show, what are some funny moments, funny quotes, things that, like, long after the series is done, you're like, you know what? That was funny. I'm I'm giggling about this. You know, it's really funny because, like, this show is known for a lot of things, but I was like, is it funny? Like, I think there are, like, there are funny moments. There are funny performances. Like, I think, like, they want you to take the roles. I think uh, Topanga. Like, I think there are, like, all these, like, little things that are fun. But I couldn't think of an episode that I was, like, oh, I just laughed throughout. I will say that uh, they're killing us in season seven. I was, like, I remember, lo- like, enjoying that episode and just having fun with it. They were all being zany. They were all being wacky. Uh, Will's performance is so stupid but like like i think of episodes like that and then of course and then there was sean another one where it's like i can't necessarily say it's funny haha but we had fun with it and there are lots of iconic things happening in that episode you know the way i interpreted this was the idea of moments like yes yes, i don't know that there are any episodes where i'm like wow that was such a hilarious episode typically because the show is in some ways a dramedy in some ways where it's like we never have an episode that's just pure humor there's always heart there which i think you know it strengthens the show but it does make it hard to find like an episode where you're like this episode is funny i instead have a few quotes in memory like moments that i want to point out to you that make me laugh um the first one is from season one morgan's on the phone during the water fight she's calling the police she says my parents are fighting and they just shot the neighbor Love that. <laughs> um, during Boy Meets Girl, uh, Corey go. Sean's like, Corey, how do you ask a girl out? And Corey says, simple, open the door and say, get out, you're bothering me. <laughs> love that. Um, Till this day, the episode on the air that I love, where Feeney comes into the coat closet that they're doing the radio show in, and Sean says, don't move, maybe he doesn't see us. I will never not find that funny. Um, Pink Flamingo Kid, when Eric says, I said to myself, Kyle, Amy goes, Kyle, he goes, that's what I call myself. <laughs> Love that for no reason, whatever. Grass is always greener. Sean says, Corey, I'm no rocket Scientologist, but I'm sen- <laughs> sensing something's wrong. Great. Um, Angela's men, all of the sneak attack shit. I know it <laughs> didn't make sense. Like story-wise, we were questioning it, but in retrospect, all of it was so much fun. Um, the seven, the hard way, AKA the piece or whatever, the Eric just, I married a moose. We don't need counseling. <laughs> Love that till this day. Um, and better than the average Corey, Sean says, Angela got an A on her essay, how to maintain a black identity when you have three very white friends. Still like a fun joke. Um, the episode getting hitch, where Ifini says, Rachel, what is Eric's favorite fish? Penguin. I don't think you understand. Bam! Love that. Um, And then my favorite joke, literally in the history of Boy Meets World, and then there was Sean. I'm dead. I'm dead. I'll get as sick as you can without actually dying. 
easily the best joke in the series. So I, you know, I when going through it, I I specifically listening to the Pod Meets World episode, I was like, wow, they're really good at pointing out well-written jokes. So yeah. I wanted to make sure that we had a portion of our review where we gave some credit to the writers for some of the things that make us giggle. Well, I think that you like a. I, I don't want to take away the writing because some of it is like really good comedic writing. Um and. Uh, I but I do want to give a shout out to writer, writer Ben and Will because mm -hmm. writer has some really good stupid Sean lines yeah. that are funny and like it's the delivery it's like that that's what makes it and again like that back with the huh what yeah. <laughs> They want you to say like, again, like like that bin. That bin... whole like uh Corey, I'm no rocket scientologist. Sean had jokes like that throughout the first three seasons of the show consistently. And they were so good. They were so I, great. I can't think of it, but like dumb Sean jokes are fun. And, mm -hmm. and Ryder did them so well. Um, Eric, like in general, a lot of what you're saying, like I was thinking about um Again, I, I've already said I laugh, and even to this day, I laugh thinking about um, Jack banging Eric's head against mm -hmm. Jimmy. No, never. Mm -hmm. ah! like, again, it's stupid, but it's fun. Um, like I the, found that to be very homoerotic. Seven the hard way. When again, um, what is it, Mister Matthews? Uh, Plays with, <laughs> oh no, no, Eric plays with, plays with? Mr. Matthew, Mr. Squirrels, Squirrels. <laughs> like, 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 again, like all, all of those things. Like it's stupid and it's dumb and it's funny and Will does such Will a good job in the painting during the Angelus Men episode. I hated that. I, I hated, hated it, but it's also so iconic. Him in the couch, so iconic. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, again, Ben, Ben is hilarious. Like, yeah, Ben is given like really good stuff mm -hmm. to do. Um, and then again, like like some of the line delivery, like the whole um, and the and then there was Sean. Uh, we'll always remember he was this tall. Oh. Like, again, that's stupid. It's so stupid, but it's so so fun. great. Uh, and I I think that they're this is a funny cast. Yeah. Um, uh, when Topanga says his lava, like again, <laughs> it's look again. The, you're just laughing at it because some of these things are just in their delivery and they're really well and done. To that point, there's something I want to say that I we don't say a lot. I want to give some credit to Michael Jacobs because the more I'm learning from listening to Pod Meets World, the more I'm learning that some of these jokes, the reason why they were funny was because of a delivery that was a note given by Michael Jacobs, where they talk about their note sessions and they're like, no, Michael has a very specific way he wants you to say this line. Most of the time, like that, most of the jokes that we're talking about, it's because of how they said it underpants like yeah. it's a way that you said it that made it funny and yes will is very creative and original and can probably has probably turned a lot of things into gold that weren't meant to but i think the rest of the cast owes a lot to michael jacobs to those note sessions so i just want to tip my cat to tap tip my cap to him because i feel like he had a big part to play in some of these humorous moments that we're talking about to your point audience i, I want someone to tell me what do you think is the most funny written episode because Ooh. i will say to your point like this it has a lot of funny jokes and it's like written really comedically in some spaces so like what like objectively like i'm talking like what is your airplane where it's like if you were to read the script you would just be laughing uh and it's really funny because like um i, I just want to bring this up i because I, I want to it, it's our podcast i'll do whatever i want but um i was thinking of the uh friends episode the one with the embryos that is yes. known as like one of the the most quotable icon. Honestly, I think and then the Rashawn is the Boy Meets World equivalent to that episode in terms of just being so quotable and so consistently funny. I I think the one with the embryos is a good comparison to and then the exactly. Rashawn. Exactly, and I, I like the difference is the one with the embryos again is canon. I think there's mm. something to be said about like an episode that is able to be funny and canon, but maybe and then there Rashawn is in fact like the best written version. Mm -hmm. of, yeah. of, of Siege, as we reflect back, you know, you and I have had these, uh, after every episode of Boy Meets World that we review, we talk about things that stood out to us, one of which has been the Feeny lessons. Mm -hmm. Are there any Feeny lessons that we've talked about, any Feeny lessons throughout the series that have stuck with you, things that you consider to be like maybe one of the better Feeny lessons? 
Um, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I thought about this, and one of the ones that came to the forefront was this idea of uh, it's actually the cherry bomb episode. Ooh. And when Feeney has the canvas, yeah, and he goes, "Look at this. You see how strong it is, but like a little nit, mm -hmm. it just falls. Like it just tears." And it may seem small now, but it leads to like a bigger. I like that sticks with me. Not the exact wording, obviously, but like um, in general, that imagery of like Feeney with the canvas, mm -hmm. and then also, uh, I I'm if we want to talk about ones that like just have stuck with me, Feeney with the plant and being like, oh, this plant struggled and it didn't want to leave. Yeah, but I had to move it for its own good and then it grew and it became it, it was flourishing it's the graduation episode and Corey goes because you thought it would stop uh because you could thought it would do better outside and feeney said no because i thought it would stop growing if i didn't move it outside how Great. amazing like like stuff like that mm -hmm. are, is so good and one more with feeney is the episode where alan keeps Corey up late yes um, father and... knows less Father knows less. And Feeney tells the story about his father and how all he wanted to do was spend time with his father. But his father didn't want to spend time with him. Like, I think that is such a good Feeney yeah. moment and Feeney lesson. And then another one would be um, what we've been calling the Inuit, which is to say, uh, hey, Feeney, anything's possible. Yeah. And like that little lesson. It's so of, funny because that's not like a quote in terms of like lessons but the whole episode is a feeny lesson i think yeah. the inuit it's so unfortunate the title of this episode yeah. <laughs> and how they keep using it but like that word but uh we're talking about what's what's labeled as the eskimo but we understand now that that's a slur so we've been calling it the inuit for those who are just jumping into this conversation but it's such a great episode in so many ways that it it being called that is the thing that probably hurts that episode the most. Cause that's actually one of my favorite episodes of the, se yeah. of the series. Yeah. I, I remember even telling you, I don't think you were as impressed with that episode as I was, but I remember telling you when we watched it the first time, like, Hey, if someone were just watching Boy Meets World, this might be one of the episodes I show them just to get them into it. You're right. Because I don't think like overall I was, but I, 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 I would be lying if I said that wasn't an episode that just like lives throughout. Yeah. Yeah, for me, not only because of like its iconography in terms of like being at the Super Bowl mm -hmm. and being on a billboard and all this other stuff, but like the fact that Feeney is specifically trying to teach lessons yeah. to Corey, Sean, and Topanga, and he makes each one of their lessons specific to that individual. Yeah, and he's like, you need to learn specifically this thing. But then and also, I, go ahead. I just want to say to that, like the lessons that they learned in that episode are not tech. Like, yes, they're getting a grade for it, but they're not school assignments. This is like a side quest that Feeney is doing to challenge and deepen these characters, uh, these kids that he's formed a relationship with, which I think adds to it is like those moments when a teacher took a little extra time with us. That's why this feels so good. Yes. I mean, I go back to B&B's b, &B, &B. Mm -hmm. like The idea of that, the lesson of that episode where Feeney's like, hey, I guess I still have something to learn. Yeah. Um, And it's not too late. And everyone, everyone learns something about themselves. I think it's great. And th these are moments that I really feel are impactful. And I think that it's all these moments that we're thinking about that make Boy Meets World as legendary as it is. 100%. Um, I actually have, I have a list. I'm going to go through these as quickly as possible. I'm going to start with Eric, because Eric actually gives some great lessons. The first one that I want to give Eric is lose one friend, lose all yep. friend, lose yourself. I think is great. I love that quote. I think you could hear that separate from the episode and it still have weight um the other one i want to uh, do is from learning to fly where eric says to corey throughout your life there are going to be a lot of opportunities that come up and they're going to seem great and they're going to seem wonderful and they're going to seem to make your life a heck of a lot easier but you have to walk away and at that and at times it's going to seem really difficult to do that but you have to because you deserve better i just think that whole quote and everything that happened in season four with uh eric and Corey and everything i just think that's a great quote second uh, i want to move on to topanga topanga has a quote from i believe it's season three i don't remember the exact episode where she says they're doing yearbook quotes and they asked topanga what her yearbook quote is and she says you do your thing, I do mine. You are you, and I am I. And if in the end, we end up together. It's beautiful. 
but always, always love that quote. I think I even signed a few yearbooks with that in college, <laughs> in high school. Now, I have a few from Feeney that I want to try to roll through because I think they're all great. George Feeney, if you let people's perception of you dictate your behavior, you will never grow as a person. Mm -hmm. Next quote. But to me, a real hero is someone who does the right thing when the right thing isn't the easy thing to do. Next one. See, it's not enough to leave school and just desire to succeed in this cold, cruel world because you've simply become a part of it. That was Feeney talking to Jack during the season six episode where they're working at the uh, student union. Jack is trying to have Eric learn from him, and Feeney's like, no, you need to learn from Eric. Um, the next one, you don't have to be blood to be family. Yeah. Great quote. And uh, sometimes the things you can, this is from uh, the graduation episode. Sometimes the things you complain the most about are the things you care the most about. And unfortunately, we don't always know that until it's too late. And then he looks at Sean. He's like, by the way, how's your paper going? And because he was supposed to do a paper about how he felt about school lending and it just calls Sean out in the best way. And then the last one, of course, George Feeney, believe in yourself, dream, try, do good. So, yeah, so many absolutely. great, so many great Feeney absolutely, moments. Absolutely. Um, um all right. The set, the other thing we do when we uh, wrap up an episode, we talk about the Feeney lesson, but we also talk about the bra moments. You know, before we get into specific moments that stood out to us throughout the show, this whole idea of a bra moment this whole is really essential to our podcast. It's about looking at things from the '90s with a 2000s point of view, looking at it from a millennial uh, from a millennial point of view, but also a melanated point of view. There's so many things that we took into consideration when we were putting this podcast together around the idea of a bra moment. Um, how do you feel? Boy Meets World has, uh, I guess, the cultural impact considering everything that we've talked about, would you feel like the show has communicated about politics, about race, about class, about like, how do you feel like it did overall in terms of handling some of the more serious bra topics that we've discussed? If I'm going to be honest, overall, not great. Like <laughs> overall, it's, I mean, like here's the thing, overall, if you want to talk about class, it says that if you don't have an education, if you're poor, like you are worth less. Like that's, the show's thesis statement anytime we talk about class um, yeah. and that uh, even if you are poor it's your responsibility to go to school so people won't consider you less than yeah uh, don't try to change the systems don't um look for the actual cause of the problem instead it's probably you um, yeah. and then another thing if we're going to be honest like holistically women don't really have stories of their own to tell like women are most likely either a bitch or a servant or, or a vixen or a vixen. That's what women have to offer. That's what the series as a whole says. And to your point, and, and also one of the worst things you can be is gay. Um, Like, like again, like I, I, I think, you know what, even to that part, I will say very often I will give the show credit for saying kind of like a doing a not that there's anything wrong with it. yeah there's a lot of that to homo like uh same-sex relationships or any gay characters like they will identify oh sean has a trans uncle um this particular person is gay and everyone in school is okay with it like it'll yada yada over a lot of these sexual identity topics but mm -hmm. at the exact same time go out of its way to be like by the way Corey and Sean aren't gay. Eric and Jack aren't gay. And it's like, you can say that it's not a problem all you want to, but also you feel like uh, the audience thinking that they are gay is something that you need to shoot down. So that's I couldn't honestly agree more with you in terms of how the show handles uh, the female characters, in terms of how it handles um, homosexuality and all of those like gay panic jokes. I think the thing that I'm walking away with in like overall after seven seasons of the show is that I feel like I understand what it me meant to be a white liberal in the 90s. Correct. I Correct. understand what it meant from this, from just the point of view of the show to be a white dude in the 90s and to think you're really progressive when you're not nearly as progressive as you believe yourself to be. And I think 
all of the hopes and ideals that Michael Jacobs tried to infuse into the show were crippled by his own lack of self-awareness to how he actually feels about women and gays and people of color. Um, you know, I went through, this was a side quest that I had no business doing. <laughs> I went through every episode of the show, just like on Wikipedia, just like looked at the title, read the synopsis, reminded myself of it. And I was like, does this talk about class? Does this talk about education? Let's talk about, like I made a huge list, right? And one of the things I've learned is that the show has a lot of episodes that dive into ideas identity, the dive into literature and the arts, love and romance, friendship. But I think we maybe talk about race specifically one time. I think we what? have like maybe two or three episodes about politics. Um, like religion strangely gets more like moments than race does in a city like Philadelphia. So there's just like it in terms of understanding what the 90s was the clinton era that this show aired i think there's a lot to walk away with in terms of like what was society's overall belief system leading up into the 90s and leaving the 90s and i think that watching boy meets world is a great way for you to get into the psyche of a white dude from the 90s that considers himself a good guy but is actually a little problematic so um, I just... is that not the clinton years I mean, like, <laughs> well yeah reality. i mean that's and that's the 90s in, in terms of pop culture in like a, a nutshell. And I think just think that there's a lot of this series that contributes to that for me. Um, obviously, this is a real zoomed out perspective, but I just, you know, after seven seasons, this is the aftertaste I have. It's like you thought you were progressive and there was a lot of attempts. And as a person of color, I'll say that as a person of color, sometimes the attempt isn't good enough. Well, so here's like it's so funny that you say that. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna disagree that sometimes the attempt isn't good enough. I will say, I will say that two things can be true. I will say that it was probably the most progressive um of its time, of its height, of its night. You know what I'm saying? Like I feel like uh, at least for a, a white driven show, I feel like there's a reason why we all gravitated towards it. And I would say it's very much like the Clinton years in the sense of it tries to be colorblind. It tries mm -hmm. to say that crime is a problem of people not having their act together. Yeah. It tries to say that women can't can do anything, but isn't the house and home still something you want? Like that's, all of those things are actively what the 90s were about. And we have to admit that they were absolutely a pivot from the selfish, greed-driven 80s. Yeah. And right before we got to the racist, chaotic 2000s. So I feel like it had good intentions and it did really well for the time that it was. And it Can I just say one thing? And I heard this on Twitter, so don't quote me on this. But... Not to disagree with everything you said, because I do think it's valid, but I heard someone say on Twitter that we only use the excuse it was of the time for whiteness and for the patriarchy. You know, honestly, I love that. I hadn't heard that before, but I, I want to say, but here's the thing. I don't disagree, and I, I love that. But we also have to, as yeah. two Black podcasters, mm -hmm. we have to understand that everything in our lives is measured with an asterisk. Sure. We're not saying that this thing is progressive because it's actively progressive. We're saying, considering how whiteness is and how prevalent whiteness is and how prevalent patriarchy is, this is progressive. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, like even the politics that we're in right now, like Obama and all this other stuff. Obama is not by any means the most progressive. Yeah president we could have had compared to um the thoughts and times that we were aware of and what yeah. he was able to do or what we thought he was able to do while he was in office but given the boundaries and like containment that he had pretty okay job again looking if you are going to compare reagan and bush to clinton you're going to be like honestly Clinton had problems, but and you know which what? One I would think, I do again? That's I think, all. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, no, and I think this is such an interesting conversation because I think there's a lot of truth to it. Like there's there's one view of it which is they did the best they could with 
knowing what they knew. Correct. And then there's us coming in as millennials being like, even considering all of that, there was a lot of things that didn't hit the mark. And I think that important thing about our podcast was having that conversation because right. I think both things are true. Like you said, both things can be true. The show tried really hard and also just didn't hit the mark a lot of the time. Exactly. Um, or it hit the mark in one way, but you're like, at what cost? Like, yeah. I think there are plenty of times where it's like, oh, this is a great lesson to teach boys and men, but uh, women are watching too. Uh, yeah. Brown people are watching too. Or that may have been the right thing for you to do of your socioeconomic status, but that is not advice that you should be telling every child across yeah. the globe because that's simply not true. Like to be like college is the only way. And if you don't go to college, your whole life will be ruined. We were like, trade school is a thing. <laughs> and to your point, I don't know that Eric or Sean either benefited from college, really. Absolutely. So it's this situation. And it's even funnier when you realize that Michael didn't go to college. So this idea of saying you have to go to college or else your entire life will be ruined and you can't find success without it, while also being someone who didn't go to college and benefited from all of these social programs, it's like that's 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 the bruh of it all. Yeah. Of us looking back and being like, this had a lot of really good things that it was trying to say. But also, I mean, like, again, bringing Angela and having an interracial relationship for kids to see and idealize, being able to show male friendship as equally important and something that you should value, um, being able to see someone like Eric who kind of wasn't book smart but had yeah. emotional intelligence, seeing one like someone like Topanga who was um, – who for the most of the show was just a girlfriend, but who we understood had progressive ideas and wasn't afraid to be alternative. Yeah. All of those things are extremely impactful and extremely important and changed a generation. But at the exact same time, it said things like, do women really need to talk? <laughs> also like do you really do do you need to give this white dude a hard time? Like he's doing the best he can. Like yeah, yeah, just take what you can get. Trying like, 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 yes, he's making everything about himself, but also, wouldn't you if you were him? Like, that's that's ultimately what we, we talked about white boy logic early on. And white boy logic is something that we come up time and time again. Yeah. This only makes sense if you yourself are a straight white male with main character syndrome. Then 100%. every single action makes sense. But once you step outside of that, then you have problems. And, and you know what yeah. I one thing I and I know we've said this so many times but I think it's so important just like the historical context of all of this it wasn't just Corey Matthews it, it was Dawson it was yep. Ted Mosby it yep. was like it was Ross, Ross Geller. Geller it was Zach Morris it was like there were so many examples I would even say like maybe even Michael J Fox on Family Ties a little bit like there's so many examples of characters who just convince themselves and everyone in their lives that they were great, even though they were shitty. And so I just think like, again, I'm learning a lot about whiteness, about what it meant to be male and the mindset that in the nineties, that transitional period, right before the millennium, like what was the standard, what was considered standard really? Right. Like, again, I think like for me, I think of it as you have a show like Boy Meets World that is on the air and you also have Tim, the tool man, Taylor. Mm. And again, if we had to choose, this is like voting again. It's like if you had to vote for which one you would want your child to emulate, they're not the greatest options. But you know one... what's so interesting <laughs> about home improvement is that home improvement, if you watch the pilot, it's literally written as like Tim is supposed to be this over the top macho machismo character, and his wife is supposed to be like the feminist counterbalance to that. But what ends up happening is that they end up turning Tim into Urkel essentially with the grunting and the over the top antics to the point where like they just make that the focus to where they completely lose the feminist counter argument to everything that's Tim Taylor. And so right. it's so interesting that like, yeah, that's another example of a white man thinking he's doing his best, but having a lot of overlooked uh, problematic issues that aren't being addressed. And then there's also like what you walk away from. Like mm -hmm. there's lots of things where I'm like this, I remember there being episodes where we were like the lesson of this episode is good. 
that is not the takeaway of this yeah. episode. That is not what you Or like those moments where we're like, yeah, we can tell you guys had something you were trying to push, but the execution did not lead to that conclusion. You didn't actually say it. You didn't yeah. actually say like I like I don't want to I don't want anyone to think that there's an episode. So I just, I want to make it very clear. I am speaking in hyperbole at this moment, but like, it's something where it's like, the implication is don't hit women. Yeah. But you do everything but say, don't hit women. We, You and I will watch it and be like, I need you to actually say these words. So I know that you know that we actually shouldn't be doing this and not yeah. just implying that it's an alternative take. <laughs> well, let me let me ask you this. Are there specific examples from the show that you're like, this was a good bra moment, this was a bad bra moment? I, I don't feel like that's fair because of my memory. I don't I <laughs> that's I that's fine. That's fine. I just there's a there I let me let me let me start over. You know, to that point, I have to say, I actually want to talk about a few examples of some like good bra moments and bad bra moments specific from the show because i think you're right there's times when they succeed there's times they don't um like for example i think some of uh my favorite episodes are the ones that discuss class i think santa's little helper i ain't gonna spray lettuce no more janitor dad i think these are all great versions of that it's when we get into some of these like other issues that i struggle with so for example when discussing crime I think Dangerous Secret, I think Everybody Loves Stuart, I think these are great ways to handle crime. I don't think, and in case I don't see ya, be true, the war, if you can't be with the one you love, where they piss on the cop car and they have no consequences from it. Like, there are so many episodes where they, like, skirt over things that we were like, if you were a Black kid, this would be a completely different situation. Absolutely. And, and there's just so many moments throughout the show. I mean, like, I don't want to go through all of them, but there's so many times where I'm just like, this was the worst way to do this. And honestly, the biggest one that comes to mind, Amy is pregnant. She wants a baby shower. Corey hires a stripper for her baby shower, specifically to ruin it so he can end it early and go out with Topanga. And I'm like, what are we supposed to walk away with here? Exactly. Well, so it's funny because I was thinking about um, Last Tango in Philly and this oh, idea of like the girls just want to dance. Like, that's it. And like the whole thing is men don't dance. I'm not dancing. Oh, wait, foreign men are willing yep. to dance. Well, if foreign men are willing to dance, then I guess we'll dance as well. And we'll make the dancing about ourselves and we'll do a grand gesture. And mm -hmm. at no point in time will we pull you aside and actually tell you that we want to and also we won't do this again like so yeah. that's my whole thing of like i think that the show has really good potential uh, very often and you're like oh there was something here but then there are also times where it's like but at the end of the day he's not gonna do this every week you know uh okay. what i because I went through the episodes and I kind of categorized them based off of what they talked about. And I highlighted the ones I was like, oh, great. like these the good, these the bad. When it came to gender relations, that's the one where there's the most red flags. The beard. Hey, Corey, hold on to this girl while I figure out what to do with her. The turnaround yeah. dance. We're going to make this geek into someone worth going out with and I'm still going to treat her like shit. You're married, you're dead. You like, uh, what a drag. Like, there are so many times that the gender topic is just handled so poorly right. that I just think that of all of the topics that they tried to go into, that was the one they, they really fumbled the most, probably. Okay, so yeah, we went through our best and worst. We went through funny moments, bra moments. Uh, I think that that's it for this episode. That's it for this episode. That is not it for our conversation. You guys, oh. you know, we just we just can't stop talking about this show. Um, so uh, we hope that you will come back next week where we will continue our conversation on the series of Boy Meets World. Um, we want to hear from you, so please reach out to us at bromeetsworld at gmail.com or at bromeetsworld on all the places. Yo are doing a great job of commenting on our YouTube, so please check that out. Give us your- Oh, please uh, follow us, subscribe to us on YouTube if you haven't already. That helps us out so much. Absolutely, and our Patreon. If you are enjoying these conversations, then you probably enjoy our Patreon conversations where we react to Pop Meets World, um, and we also have some other fun stuff up there, so uh, check out our oh, Patreon. Oh, actually, can I say one more thing? Yeah. Spotify has a new feature where you can now leave comments on episodes, so if you guys like this episode, you can comment comment directly to it with your questions or comments and we'll be able to get that and discuss 
it on our Patreon or wherever else. So like definitely take advantage of this new comment section that Spotify has opened up. I think it's going to be a great way for you guys to get your episode specific questions answered by us. Um, and I think it's just going to be a, a great way to foster com uh, conversation about Boy Meets World. Absolutely. So you guys, thank you so much for joining us one more time. We hope to see you when we return with our new episode. And um, later, bros. And later, bros. Later, bros. This episode of Brown Meets World was produced by CJ and edited by Tony Curtis. Brown Meets World is a two free tokens media production. Bye. Bye. <laughs> when this boy meets world.